Let us stand to the in worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that he may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing our Kyrie and our hymn of praise. <laughs> Oh, 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us hear now the readings of the day. Please be seated. A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from the following, from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to sing with me in unison Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly your salvation is very near to those who fear you. That your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have led together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the heavens, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and all man will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway. A reading from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, 
according to the riches of his, of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let it burn like fire within us, speak until our hearts are stirred. Alleluia, Lord, we sing, for the good was that you bring. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples' preaching. For Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When, the, when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. The faith we possess in God is a real good way to get killed. Or exiled, or beaten, or impoverished, or shunned. If, as we heard last week, faith is vulnerability, and that means risk-taking. 
And we hear today of two ways, at least, in which those risks play out. Now, we already know this because we mark ourselves and our spaces with the sign of the cross. You know the sign of the cross, right? That's the sign of the cross, which is a sign of an implement of state torture and state execution. We do this because we are remembering and claiming the death of Jesus Christ on ourselves, our spaces, and our lives. So faith, our vulnerable risk-taking for the sake of others, is what we receive from Jesus, and we are called by Jesus to faithfulness until death. And when I say death, I am not being hyperbolic. I am not being exclusive either. Amos, for example, to our knowledge, was not murdered for his witness. But Amos dared to bring a message from God that did not reflect well on the nation, in this case, the nation of Israel. Now note, Amos is not actually from Israel. Amos is from Judah, that country to the south that no one likes. He is in a nation not his own, speaking prophetically against that nation's policies, especially in relationship to the poor and vulnerable. And he is declaring God's coming judgment on that nation, in that nation's capital, and in the national temple. Think the national cathedral. It's hardly surprising the response he receives. What is startling for us, I think, more is his reaction to that response. When he's told to keep silent, he responds, he no more chose this role of his than Amaziah, the false prophet, or Jeroboam, the king of Israel did. It's God's call to faithfulness that Amos is answering. And Amos is doing what he's doing, not because he wants to, or because he thinks it's smart, or because he thinks everyone will like it, but because he is faithful. Hopefully the connection to John the baptizer is obvious. And in that case, being true to faith till death was quite literal. John's criticism of another political leader leads to his death. In this case, what is startling is not so much John's faithfulness and its articulation, but the ineptitude of the leadership of the nation. Now, Jeroboam, king of Israel, may have been a bit dependent on his courtiers and court prophets, but Herod is too impotent to manage his own decisions. He is cast about like a boat in a storm, capsized by a dance from his daughter and the strength of his own wine and the agenda of his own wife. At a feast of the elites of the nation, drunken decisions kill, and no food satisfies hatred and fear. John is beheaded because he is faithful in spite of this indifference, this demonic bondage to forces that destroy life, that care nothing for justice or mercy or compassion. What is this faithfulness that means political and social risk, that means risking our very lives at times? Can faith really be worth that much risk? Well, our reading from Ephesians says that it is in every way. According to the New Testament and the various letters on the topic, some from Paul, some inspired by Paul, our faithfulness comes from God, the one who was first faithful to us. After all, it is God who chose us. Just as God called Amos, just as God sent John, just as God anointed Christ. It is God who was first faithful to us. It is God who gives us the witness to carry to the people of our communities, the people in our world, the people who labor under corrupt, indolent, incompetent, and fear-driven authorities. It's God who made us a part of God's own mission in Jesus Christ, to gather up all things into God, from whom and through whom and for whom all things exist. The mission of Jesus Christ is this very faithful, prophetic, living, and dying. This faithfulness unto death 
This risk of living faith in the view of any who care to hear and see. Each one of us and all of us together discern faithfulness and what it looks like in this time and this place. Faithfulness might be truth telling. It might be political or social reform. It might be generosity. It might be worship. It might be self-reflection and repentance. Normally, it's all of the above and more. But faithfulness, whatever it calls us to, faithfulness is not safe. Nothing worth dying for is safe. Pregnancy, or so I'm told, not safe. Being a child, unfortunately, in this world is not safe. Immigration is not safe. Forgiving those who wrong us is not safe. Giving away our resources to those who have less than ourselves is not safe. Trusting in God is not safe. Not in the way the world defines safety, at least. God's call, God's gift, is faith till death. And this, dear friends, is at the heart of who we are. It's why we have the cross on ourselves and our spaces. What we confess, the faith to which we are witnesses, must be worth dying for, or it is not true. We cannot go before the world proclaiming the resurrection of Christ when we deny the resurrection in the way we live. If Christ was raised, why are Christians hoarding wealth? If Christ is raised, why are Christians hiding their own sin and guilt rather than repenting? If Christ is raised, why do Christians ally with political powers that bring death to the poor and the marginalized? If Christ is raised, why are Christians so obsessed with taking care of themselves regardless of the cost to their neighbors? Well, it's simple. It's because faith, faith in Jesus Christ, calls us to a life that is very different from the life most of us have been taught and raised in. It's against our habits, our customs, our assumptions. The faithful life has different values and priorities, and old habits die hard. So God comes again. God comes to us again, again and again to give us faith, this faith till death. Faith to change how we spend our money and how we vote and how we spend our time and how we spend our energy and how we think about ourselves as a congregation of Jesus Christ. If Christ is raised from the dead, if the call to faith cannot be destroyed by a ruler's threats, if the message denouncing the evils of corrupt and unjust government cannot be silenced by police executions, if we in short believe that in God mercy and justice have kissed, then we have become a new kind of people, a new kind of community. And because God gives this faith, the faith till death, our questions are quite different from the questions we grew up with, from the questions of the world. Because God gives us this faith till death, we no longer ask, how will we survive? But how will we witness? Because God gives us this faith till death, we no longer ask, what will work, but what is faith? Because God gives us this faith till death, we no longer ask, what will happen to us, but what will happen to our neighbors? Because God gives us this faith till death, we practice dying daily. We are prepared for death at any time, in any place. And because God gives this faith till death, death no longer holds any power over us. Because God gives us faith till death, we are free to live, truly live, in fearless faith, to receive the peace the world cannot give, to demonstrate that another world is not only possible, but is on her way. Because God gives this faith till death, we are no longer obsessed with ourselves. We are free to see and love those who are not like us, those in whom God has come to meet us. Because God gives, gives us this faith, faith till death, we are also a part of this mission, the mission of Amos 
and the mission of John the baptizer, and the mission of Paul of Tarsus, and the mission of Jesus of Nazareth, the mission of this God, the one who alone gives life and who is making all things new. And this faith we will be true to till death. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you, as you are able, to join with us, and if you desire to stand with us as we sing our hymn of the day, Faith of Our Fathers, hymn 813. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was in arms with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy Parent, we welcome your people into one family and gather all things to yourself. Bestow your grace upon your beloved church. Lavish your wisdom upon us and redeem us from our faults. And by our witness, all might praise your glory. Work through our bishops, Elizabeth and Tracy, our Dean Matthew, our pastor, and our council, that we may proclaim the good news faithfully. Sustain all the baptized and increase their faith, especially the people of First in Montclair, Resurrection in Hamilton Square, Holy Trinity in Magnolia, and the Northwest Washington Synod, the Lower Susquehanna Synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in European Russia, and the Lutheran Church in Singapore, that your glory may be proclaimed throughout the earth. Lord, in your mercy, our prayer. Awesome Creator, you steadfastly tend to the smallest of seeds and the mightiest of sycamore trees. Spring up green growth from the earth, nourish the growth of fruit, grain, and other crops, and bless the work of farmers and laborers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the oppressed, turn the ears of those who are empowered to the voices of the prophets in our own day. Protect those who speak difficult truths when it's risky to do so. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of strength, you are near to those who endure difficulty. Comfort all who are survivors of violence. Guard the refugee and the immigrant and protect all those who are victims of prejudice and discrimination. Be present to those in need, especially Fred, Nathaniel, Jean, Matt, Alf, Alfred, Trish, John, Bruce, Nancy, and Bonnie. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, we pray for this holy house and all those who worship here. We pray especially for those whose efforts behind the scenes often go unnoticed. For our church council, Linda, Jim, Karen, Denise, Marianne, Todd, Don, and for all our volunteers. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We thank you, God, for the saints, martyrs, and prophets who have died in the faith, especially Jim, George, Phyllis, Linda, Jean Marie, Benedict of Nursia, Nathan Sardaglum, Bartolome de las Casas. United with them as God's children, assure us that we are yours forever. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you at this time, as you are able to share the peace with one another in a safe and healthy way, I suggest a peace sign or a bow. As we set the altar, it is also time for me to remind you that this ministry exists because of your generosity and your leadership and your willingness to work and to spend time. That's true, especially of our volunteers in our church council. If you'd like to make a physical donation, 
You can do so through the Gift Plus app, through direct deposit set up by a bank code. You can mail us a check or you can use the offering plate found in the rear of the knee. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds and all that we are given to God as God gives us the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. I invite you, dear friends, to stand and pray. Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills are gathered together to become one grain, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory of Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you.
For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary man, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we, and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. 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 Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Forgive us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today, communion will be distributed by dipping. I will dip a wafer, a piece of the bread, into the wine and hand it to you. You may take it with fingers without touching my hand, or present your palm, and I will drop the bread into your hand. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Behold what you are, and become what you see. This is the body of Christ. Amen. O Lamb of God, you bear the sin of the world away. You will suffer death of a life to stay. Have mercy now, we pray. O Lamb of God,
Friends, I invite you to stand as you pray. Praise God, this meal you have drawn us to your heart, you nourished us at your table with food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. Now send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and evermore through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. For the blessing, there are a number of announcements to be made. One of these that I know of very distinctly is our reviving church meeting, which uh, has always previously been held only on Zoom, is now both in person and on Zoom. My, uh, the laptop for the Zoom call will move downstairs for that. Uh, that will be the Sunday morning prayer call, same call. You don't have to come anywhere on Zoom. Uh, if you're here in person, it's in the downstairs larger conference room. Linda Bacon is our leader for, for those discussions. Thank you, Linda. I do not know of any other urgent announcement. Are there other announcements for the good of the community? Well, just PBS is coming up. Thank you for the reminder. Like July 19th. Yes, Vacation Bible School starting July 19th, and Linda Bacon and Diane Brockler are facilitating that. Contact them for more information. That's 3 to 5 p.m. every night, Monday to Friday, that week. Seeing no other announcements, I invite you to bow your head and receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us sing our sending song, Thankful Hearts and Voices Raised. <laughs> Thankful hearts and voices raised, everyone what God has done. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice and bear Christ's holy name. Send us with your promises, O God, and lead us forth in time. Thanks, Keith.